Since the beginning, Nintendo has always taken measures to ensure the quality of their products and to mitigate bootlegging and unauthorized tampering of their games and hardware. In North America and Europe, the Nintendo seal of quality was stamped on all official licensed Nintendo products. While it's easy to disregard it as some quick marketing gimmick, the seal was important. In 1985, after the video game crash, Nintendo was looking to bring the Famicom to North America as the Nintendo Entertainment System or NES. At the time, no retailer would even think about trying to sell video games. So to win back their confidence, Nintendo did two things. First, the NES was designed to look like a VCR. And more importantly, Nintendo ensured that every single NES game went through an approval process by Nintendo Japan president Hiroshi Yamashi. This would ultimately stop, for the most part, the flood of low quality and unlicensed games that killed the video game market before the crash. The seal of quality worked, and the NES rejuvenated the industry in North America, selling over 34 million units and over 60 million worldwide. But in order to pull this off, Nintendo introduced anti-tampering hardware in both the console and its cartridges. Nintendo was not happy after the video game crash in North America, and they wanted to come up with ways to break back into the market, but they knew it was going to be difficult. So they decided to come up with an ingenious approach to locking out unauthorized tampering and unlicensed games from the up and coming Nintendo Entertainment System. In 1985, Nintendo engineer Katsuya Nakagawa filed a patent titled A System for Determining Authenticity of an External Memory Used in an Information Processing Apparatus. This patent goes into detail outlining the concept of a game cartridge containing a key device and a console containing a lock device as an anti-piracy or anti-tampering system. The key and lock devices were controller chips that formed what was known as the 10NES. The 10NES was also known as the Checking Integrated Circuit or CIC. It was specifically designed for front-loading North American and European NES consoles. The way that it works is relatively simple. On the main NES motherboard is a chip known as the lock. This is a 4-bit sharp CPU and each game cartridge contained the exact same 4-bit chip. This was known as the key chip. Both chips contained the exact same code. The design was based around a simple lock and key paradigm. You use the key or the cartridge to unlock the console and play the game, which is located on the motherboard. When the cartridge was inserted to the NES, both the key and the lock chips would communicate with each other with custom code. And if the check was successful, the CIC chip would allow the game to run. If the test failed, the system would reset itself and on repeat failures it would reset over and over, essentially locking the game out. Digging a little deeper, these 4-bit chips are directly wired to each other and run the exact same code at the exact same time, exactly in step with each other. Both chips calculate what data needs to be transferred to the other, and if what was received is not what was expected, the lock chip then resets the console. To further obfuscate what the code was doing, there is a total of 16 different unique streams of data that can be generated. This is done by use of the seed pin which acts as a random generator and decides which one of the 16 streams it needs to use. It then lets the key chip know of its decision. There's also the reset speed pins which keep track of how quickly the reset needs to be set to. While the lock and key paradigm is one that's very common when it comes to security and anti-tampering, the code itself was another story. Although it's possible to extract dumps of the CIC ROMs themselves, no one actually knew how the CPU worked. I mentioned earlier that Nintendo did the best it could to stop the flow of unlicensed games on the NES, but they weren't successful in doing this completely. There were still some unlicensed games that appeared on the NES, and these companies that were developing these games resorted to brute force methods in order to circumvent the CIC circuitry. The first examples of this was to simply spike the voltage, in other words, send a kind of voltage spike over the wire in order to just to knock out the chip itself. And then from this, then they decided to utilize a donor cartridge approach where you would plug in the unlicensed version of the game using a licensed cartridge as the donor chip in order to play the unlicensed game itself. Atari, still reeling from the video game crash, were unhappy with Nintendo's heavy-handed licensing model and released unlicensed games on its Tengen brand by coming up with a method to bypass the CIC check and Nintendo's security. In order to do this, they would need to reverse engineer the chip. 
but this proved to be difficult. After many different attempts at building data capture hardware between the lock and key chips, and even attempts to decap the chip to understand the internals, bypassing the CIC would prove to be extremely difficult. But after a few months, Atari unveiled their own equivalent of the CIC known as the Rabbit, which was used in some of their games, with the most popular being Tetris. The now famous story is that Atari got access to the 10 NES code by filing a case in court requesting it. This resulted in Nintendo suing Atari in court and winning. Atari claimed fair use as their defense and lost. But the CIC chip stood firm. Nintendo used the chip in the Super NES and Nintendo 64 consoles with some enhancements but it still used the same sharp 4-bit CPU. And even by 2006, the chip was still not cracked and no one knew how the code worked. Now to be clear, the CIC chip itself was very difficult to reverse engineer, but it was quite trivial to bypass. What I mean by that is by opening up the NES system and getting to the motherboard, it was simply easy enough to disable the reset line on the CIC chip and completely disable the chip itself. This meant that many games would then just simply work and not have to worry about going through the CIC check itself. But Nintendo quickly got a hold of this and started to implement protection into their games to look for a disabled CIC and stop the game dead in its tracks. In 2006, the Nintendo homebrew community decided that it would make efforts to uncover the secrets of the CIC chip. By this time, the original patents for the chip had expired and because of more readily available hardware for hobbyists that was affordable, they quickly went to work. The problem was, the CIC chip eluded just about everyone who attempted to learn its internals and indeed how it actually worked, and once again hit the same roadblocks as before. So work shifted over to Tengen's Rabbit chip, which was almost an exact replica of the 10 NES chip anyway. But the problem was, because Atari utilized Nintendo's copyrighted code, the Rabbit chip worked exactly like the 10 NES. When the Rabbit chip was decapped, which is a process of removing the ceramic package from the chip itself by utilizing acid, but in such a way as to not destroy the chip itself, it was discovered that there were some additional circuits on the Rabbit chip that were not found on the 10 NES chip. And once voltages were applied to one of the unused pins on the rabbit, it began to dump out the contents and the state of the chip for all 16 streams of data. Once the bitstream was dumped and analyzed, it was trivial to figure out the CPU instructions of the rabbit chip and the entire code for the CIC algorithm was completely reconstructed. The discovery was fascinating. The CPU had a 4-bit microprocessor that had two registers, accumulator A and a second register X. The processor contained its own instruction set. There is only addition and subtraction functions and no branching instructions at all. There's also an exchange instruction that takes the value in register A and swaps it around with what's in register X. There's also one instruction that was never quite figured out what it did. It was known as the special mystery instruction. If it wasn't for Tengen leaving this feature on the chip, this discovery may have never occurred or at least would have taken much more time. On the Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64, CIC security chips were also used. These were similar sharp 4-bit CPU chips, but with different internal code. However, because the instruction set was known from the Tengen chip, the CIC ROM was simply dumped out, and with some trial and error, the chip was cracked pretty easily. The Super CIC is a homebrew replacement chip that can be applied to any cartridge to provide things like region swapping on demand. On the other hand, the Nintendo 64 CIC was different from the NES and Super NES and for many years on things like EverDrive or conversion cartridges would require a donor CIC from an original game to work. But in 2015, utilizing decapping techniques, the instruction set and code was once again defeated. It was known as the Ultra CIC and has become the preferred method over sacrificing original Nintendo 64 cartridges. From the original invention in the early 80s, Nintendo's lockout chip stood firm for over 20 years and three generations of console. And while the NES, Super NES were relatively similar, Nintendo 64 CIC remained a target. But with all three systems ultimately offering open source replacements, the CIC chip stood the test of time and was one of the most important chips in early cartridge-based Nintendo hardware. So there you have it guys, that's the story of early anti-piracy measures in the form of the CIC chip that spanned 20 years over three generations before it was ultimately reverse engineered in 2010. This chip stood the test of time and it was a critical piece of hardware implementation that Nintendo had the foresight to bring into the NES 
after the video game crash in order to maintain a high level of quality releases and games. Now, if you want to know more about the CIC chip, I will leave some links in the description below. These days, you can reconstruct your own CIC chips via open source methods, and that is a common practice in many of the kind of EverDrive cartridges that you'll find today. So it's pretty much an open book these days. You can get as much information as you can. And I do think it's a fascinating look at a really interesting piece of implementation from a code perspective. There is a lot going on here. And so, you know, take the time to take a look at it. If you are interested in this type of stuff, I think you'll get a lot of interesting info out of it. Well, guys, I'm going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, you know what to do. Give me a thumbs up. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.